I want to begin my message by saying I'm so thankful that salvation is not a foot race between man and the devil. I'm glad that Jesus didn't just pay the first installment on my salvation. I'm glad that I'm not billed every 30 days for my redemption. If there's one message on the face of this earth that I'd like to get over to the hearts of men, it would be the message tonight. Last night was a glorious night under this tent. Really, the service mounted last night, and people came to be saved and blessed. And last night we preached on the most precious theme in the Bible, the truth that kills or cures. It delivers or destroys, namely, the blood of Jesus Christ. And so tonight, I'd like for us to come into the Bible, a lot of wonderful scriptures that we'd like to read for you and explain to you. I think we'll call the message tonight, The Two Greatest Doctors That Have Ever Lived. They're so unusual. They really are. These doctors, you know, we're living in a time when doctors specialize in particular things. Used to, when I was born 48 years ago, a doctor was just a doctor. All of them had about the same size pill bag. All of them had calomel in the pill bag. All of them talked in terms of compound cathartics. Nearly all of them said, when they came to see you, let me see your tongue. And I tell you, the tongue tells a heap of things, doesn't it? it re- I mean spiritually and physically. I'll come to that in the morning. The kind of clothes that your tongue wears will tell you what's going on inside. Hmm? You ever heard the fellow say he, his tongue had a coat on it? Huh? You better watch that coat, boys. But that's that's not all of it either. Brother, the way you talk tells a heap about what you're thinking about on the inside. But in these other days, we have doctors who specialize. We have a doctor that he said, I'm a a, uh, practical, I'm just a general doctor. We have another doctor, he's a surgeon. We have one that's a specialist for the eye, ear, and nose. We have people that specialize in x-ray work, laboratory work, experimentation, and so forth. Tonight, I want to talk with you about two specialists. They've been specialists through all the years. The most unusual you could ever think about in all of your life. Let me tell you before I read the scripture how unusual they are. In the first place, they never make a charge. That's unusual, isn't it? And neither have they ever lost a case. And that's really unusual. They never make a charge. They never have lost a case. One is despised and the other is misunderstood. Can you imagine that? The two greatest doctors, and yet one of them is despised, and the other is really misunderstood in this old world tonight. All of the doctors hate them. They fellowship with no other doctors in all the world. They're unusual. Even though they're the greatest doctors, they have less patience than some of the quacks. Can you imagine that? Never lost a case, never made a charge, and yet most people will drive right by their office and won't even so much as knock on the door, turn in, or even ask them if they could do anything for them. I'm talking to you about the gospel tonight. The saving gospel of Jesus Christ. When they make their examinations, they have no consultations with other doctors. None. 
They never call in any other doctor in their case. Never. Thank God for that. They don't need any other. They're unusual doctors. They're unusual. And then, they never recommend an external treatment. They work on the insides altogether. Now, that's hard for the flesh to take. Because the flesh has got it already figured out. I'll, I'll show you in a minute when we come to this first doctor and knock on his door and get inside. And the flesh is going to tell the doctor what's wrong with it. Amen? And that's about the way people come to church. And they'll tell the preacher what's wrong with them. But brother, you better sit still and let the preacher tell you what's wrong with you. These are unusual doctors because they never ask the patients any questions. <laughs> they just never do. They never do ask them about the symptoms. They never ask them where they hurt. They never ask them uh, uh, what their condition has been the last 30 days. That's a strange thing. These two doctors. Now you have your Bible. It's time to read the Scripture. And, of course, you'll figure out I'm sure why we're reading the Scripture, and we must read a good deal of Scripture found in the book of Romans, that great doctrinal treatise that God sent to us many years ago. We're going to begin reading in the fifth chapter, and uh, we'll read uh, chapter 5, verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed, when there is no law. Now verse 20, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now turn with me to Romans chapter 7, and we'll begin at verse 5. That's Romans 7 and verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What should we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the Lord said, Thou shalt not cut it. But sin, taken occasion by the commandment, wrought in the old man of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. That's the death we need tonight under this tent. God send his heavenly undertaker around tonight and load us all in and haul us off and then bring some new men back for this meeting. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be under death. For sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore, this is sweet and precious, Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. But the natural man, get this now, let me comment. The natural man, he doesn't like it because it is holy. Because it is just. Because the law is good. He doesn't like it because he's bad. And when a bad man runs into a good law, he hates it. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful, for we know that the law is spiritual. But I'm carnal, soul under sin. For that which I do I allow not, for what I would that do I not, but what I hate that do I, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now, then it is no more that I, I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. There's your, there's your great revelation of human nature. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, 
dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. That's the reason we need to quit catering to the flesh. That's the reason you can't build a great church catering to the flesh because there's not anything good in the flesh. And the more you humor the flesh, the more you've got to humor the flesh. Now we hear him, we hear him cry with a broken heart, the 24 and 25, uh, the verses there. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me, deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now then, I do not know that we need much of a division between the 7th and 8th chapters because he comes into his conclusion, and we read it for you. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the Spirit, but after, uh, after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There's not any judgment, he said. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law get it? For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. And brother, as long as you depend on your works, or on uh, keeping a certain day, or on keeping certain ordinances, or doing what a certain man says, do besides the Bible, you're living by law and cannot be saved by it. The law could not do it. Now here's the fourth verse. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But oh, that ninth verse, but you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. But, he said, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now then, Let's run over, if you will, to the book of Galatians, chapter 2. And uh, this is the book, you know, that Paul had to write to the Galatian church because it looked like they wanted to go back into bondage. And he said, I'm so surprised uh, that um, you have uh, gone to another gospel which really is not another, but there be some who trouble you and would pervert the gospel. And those... Those uh, gospel perverters are still in the world. Did you know that? They're knocking on the doors awful thick these days. And unless you're grounded in the Word of God, uh, your preacher's going to be saying, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is really not another. And Paul went ahead to say, If any man preach any other gospel unto you than ye have received, let him be accursed. Put the curse of God on him. If he preaches any other gospel, there's not but one. Now let's begin reading at verse 16 of the second chapter of the book of Galatians. Now folks, if you miss the foundation of the message, you may miss the superstructure tonight. I'm talking with you and I'm laying the foundation or letting the Lord lay it with his word in the 16th verse, knowing that, that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, not any of it. No flesh shall be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. 
Now then, let's go a little bit further. We'll have to go to the third chapter, and I believe we'll have to sort of cease our reading along here in the uh, third chapter, beginning in verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It's evident. For the just shall live by faith, and the law is not a faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Now then, I want to read another verse, starting uh, at the 22nd verse, I believe, of that same third chapter. But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, here it is, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. For you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, I believe I'll stop reading there. Now let me give an illustration. He said that the, uh, that the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. After we get to Christ, we're delivered uh, from the law. I mean, the law kills. It's the law kills. The law has nothing to do, so far as our salvation is concerned, after we get saved. We're not saved by the law. We're, we're diagnosed by the law. For instance, there's a man out here, and Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And so, I see over here, in, and I saw the... Uh, a hearse taken off a while ago uh, with a siren. Looked like they were going to maybe to pick up a body or something. And uh, now, when a, when a person dies, the law didn't have anything to do with them. You can put a dead man in the back of uh, a funeral car and you can drive 125 miles an hour. It doesn't bother him. They can run every red light in town. Don't bother him. I mean, you, you can put a pistol on each side of him in a casket with him and load it to the hilt. But I'll guarantee you, when the officers run that hearse down and pull you over to the side, they're not filing charges against him. Amen? I mean, it just doesn't affect him one way or the other. I mean, the man driving the car doesn't look back and say, Hey, bud, said, am I going too fast for you? You don't mind me running through this red light, do you? Ah, oh, don't bother me. Just go ahead. For well, I'm dead to that red light. Amen? Huh. I'm dead to all speed limits. Just take off. Hey, you see what I'm talking about? Brother, the law kills, and we're dead to the law, and then we live in Christ, and Christ lives in us. Uh, these laws, they got passed around here in Tampa. They don't bother me a great deal. They don't bother me. I mean, they got a law over here in Tampa, Florida that said you can't even kill anybody. Isn't that a sight? Of course, I tell you what, that doesn't keep them from killing them, does it? That law has nothing to do with the lawless. Amen? But those of us who are not under the law, we don't need that law. There's a law here in Tampa that says that you're not to enter another man's house and take anything out of it. That doesn't affect me. I don't want what you got in your house. God saw to it that I'd have enough to put in my own house, and so I just trust Him for. Amen. That law don't bother me. My boys are on unpro- all of them on probation, and sometimes they say, "Well, brother Lord, they gave me five years probation." I said, "I won't bother you as long as you live right." I said, "I, I wouldn't care. Tell the judge he can put me on five years probation if he wants to." Amen? Praise God. I tell you, the law don't bother God's children. We're not under law. We're under grace. Under grace. And I'm going to show you in a minute, and I'm going to take plenty of time, so stay with me, on how to get into grace. Oh, I tell you, wonderful, dear friend, 
is this great doctrine. There's just one doctrine in the Bible. And the world's so confused about it. And that's grace. They don't understand. I get so tired of hearing people say, Well, I'm for grace just as much as you are. But I don't but my grace. I just go ahead and believe it's all of grace. Oh, listen, dear friend. You'd say, Brother Law, let me ask you a question. Do you believe it's possible to fall from grace? If the Bible says so, yes. I said, if the Bible says so. You said, all right, I got you. Read it. I'll read it for you. It's found in the book of Galatians. That same book we've been reading out of, isn't it? Huh? Turn on over. Let's get it. We can't run from anything in the Bible. If the Bible says you've got to be baptized in order to be saved, I believe that. And that's exactly what it says. Amen? I didn't think some of you'd say just two amens on that. <laughs> we don't have to be afraid. man said to me, oh, I think it's over in Texas, he said, uh, Brother Olaf, you know, you ought to join our movement. There's only one thing that you leave out, and that's um, you, you, you don't preach it. You've got to be baptized in order to be saved. I said, that's what you think. I preach it. He said, you mean you preach that you've got to be baptized in order to be saved and go to heaven? I said, man, I guess I do. Well, he said, boy, you, you're ready to join up with our move, man. <laughs> he said, and he asked me again. I said, sure, I believe that. The Bible said by one spirit were you all baptized into Christ. That's baptism. I said, the difference between me, you talk about the creek, and I talk about Christ. <laughs> I'm talking about grace tonight. Brother, you're not saved by works and grace. You're not saved by grace through faith plus works or plus baptism or plus a trip to the priest or plus the Virgin Mary or plus the Baptist church. You're saved by grace through faith plus nothing. You don't believe it? You're all warped in your doctrine. This is the message of the Bible. This is the message of the Bible. This is the thing that's anchored my poor stumbling feet through these 30 years. This is the one thing that kept me from going to the right and going to the left or detouring. This is the one thing that's held me these 30 years is salvation by grace. Greatest revelation God ever gave my little old foggy mind was when he told me, Son, I paid it all. I've paid it all. Brother, you'll go to heaven completely by the blood of Christ or you'll not go at all. Praise the Lord for his wonderful goodness. I tell you, well, he said, Christ has become of no effect unto you whosoever you are justified by the law. You're fallen from grace. Well, looks to me like a man can fall from grace. Yes, sir. Said you're fallen from grace. But wait a minute. Read that whole thing. Who's he talking to? He's talking to a bunch of people that had renounced salvation by grace. He's talking to a bunch that went back under the yoke, to the yoke of bondage. He went, but they went back to the law. And he said, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And you folks that have refused to come to Christ in grace, he said, you've fallen away from being justified by grace. Then they were in grace. I can fall away from the Tampa Bay. I sure can. I can fall from Tampa Bay. But it doesn't mean I'm in Tampa Bay. If I fall in the opposite direction, I'm falling from it. And oh, my dear friend, there's a lot of people that have fallen from grace because they never were in grace. Now then, I want to introduce you to the first doctor. He's always in his office. He's never gone. Now, sinner friend, if you ever intend to get in to grace, you've got to come to this doctor first, right here. Now, you're not going to like him. I'll tell you that right now. You're not going to like him. But I'll guarantee you, everybody's got to go see him. You'll never have a desire. You'll never feel a need to go to the other doctor until you come to this doctor. I've already read about him. In the Bible, his name is Dr. Law. Dr. Law. He's a great doctor. He's very firm. Not much foolishness about him at all. 
He didn't get along very well with a lot of people, and so I better go see him. I know there's something wrong with me. And so I go and step inside the office, say to the secretary, Dr. Lorian, who oh, he's always in. Will he see me? Yes, sir, he's waiting for you now. He knew you were coming today. I said, he did? I step inside and old Dr. Law, brother, he's the sternest looking doctor I've ever seen. He just told me what to do. He said, get over here. And I got over there. He said, you lay down there. And I laid down. I said, Dr. Law, do you think you can find out what's wrong with me? He said, no, sir. I don't think so. I know I can. Well, I said, that's good. I've sure been to a lot of doctors. I said, Dr. Law, how long do you think it'll take you to find out and to run me through your clinic? He said, uh, I've already run you through. I said, you mean you know all? Oh, yes, he said, I sure do. He said, you've got the same trouble every patient has ever had that's ever come to me. Well, I said, if you don't mind, just tell me what it is. He said, you have heart trouble. Ha! <laughs> oh, I said, Doc, come on now. Come on. Listen, I tell you, in the first place, surely every one of your patients wouldn't have the same thing. That doesn't even make sense to me. See, law don't make sense to the old sinner, does he? I said, Doctor, you don't understand. I've been having trouble with my hands. Now, there's something wrong. I said, I, I just sit up at night and deal with a deck of cards, and somehow or another my hands are just... And I, I just sit for hours uh, dealing with a deck of cards, and it must be my hands. No, he said, it's your heart. It's your heart. I said, Doc, I, I don't like to argue with you. I know you're a doctor, but I said, uh, uh, you, you just don't understand. I said, I, I believe I'm having trouble with my eyes. I mean, uh, it's nothing for me to sit two or three hours in one night and watch Hollywood. <laughs> I, I just said, and Doc, I'll tell you, I, I just make up my mind every night. I'm so tired when I go to bed about 11 or 12 o'clock when that late, sir, late, late, sir, gun smoke or something's over. But the next night, my eyes start looking at that. I know that I've, I'm having eye trouble. Dr. Law said, no, it's heart trouble. It's heart trouble. So I said, now, Doc, listen. Let's be reasonable about this thing. I've been living with me uh, for 48 years, and I ought to know a little something about me. And I'm telling you my symptoms. Now, I'm having trouble with my tongue. Sometimes I don't intend to say what I say, and just the worst oath you've ever heard of comes out. I've told smutty jokes, and I believe that my tongue has got a rotten spot in it somewhere. And I wish you'd come and look at my tongue. He said, I'm not going to do it. Said it's heart trouble. Are you listening? Well, I said, Doctor, you're the most stubborn doctor I've ever been to. I'm telling you what's been bothering me all the time. All the time. And and, and Doc, I know this. Now you can say what you will. I know I've got ear trouble. Because said I've just sat and listened to those nasty, filthy, smutty jokes out on the job day after day, and I've laughed at them. Now you know you've got to do something to my ears to make me stop listening to that kind of junk. He said, "Nope, it's heart trouble. Just heart trouble. That's what's wrong with you. It's heart trouble." So I said, "Now, Doc, listen. Let's be reasonable about it. I, I want to tell you something else. And I've been making a study myself. I know. Yes, sound like an old sinner, doesn't it?" He comes and tells the preacher everything's wrong with him. He don't know. He just he just is blind as a bat backing up. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't know beans about what's wrong with him. See, but he thinks he does. And some of you here right now, you think, boy, I tell you, I'm not doing so bad. I'm not doing. And so uh, he comes. I, I say to doc uh, to Doctor Law. Now, Doctor Law, you see those feet there. Now, I'm telling you the truth. Those feet have been carrying me places I ought not to go. Now, don't you stand there and tell me that I'm not having feet trouble because I'll guarantee you those feet have just been dancing all over the dance hall floors. I'll guarantee you. And these old disobedient arms of mine have been holding other people's wives and daughters in these arms. And Doc, come on and be honest with me and do something about these rotten feet and stinking arms of mine. Oh, Dr. Law didn't bat an eye. 
He said, it's your heart. He said, it's your heart. I'm, I've got to work on you. We've got, we got to get at the heart of this thing. Amen? <laughs> oh, brother, listen. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we'd quit hiding and running and come clean with God? Oh, I'm going to bring you to the judgment tonight, sinner friend. You're going to stand one of these days to give an account to God for the very message that you're hearing tonight. Oh, listen, dear friends. You'd say, Doc, I tell you there's something wrong with my taste. What I've been drinking is not good for me, but I've cultivated the taste for it. And what I didn't used to like to drink, I don't like it now. And you need probably to give me a new taster. Oh, Dr. Law said, no, it's your heart. Just go on in the direction you want to go in. That sounds like the sinner, but Dr. Law is going to stand by his guns, brother. He's going to stand by his guns. Finally, I get a little discouraged, and I say to Dr. Law, well, it just seems to me like you're so unreasonable. Now then, now then, I want you to write my diagnosis and tell me what's going to happen to me. Just if you know so much about it and I can't help you in any way, then tell me right now. He said, all right. So, brother, I mean, he still doesn't bat an eye. He takes out his pencil, fountain pen, and he writes, D-E-A-T-H, death, signed, Dr. Law. He said, take that into the nurse. Take it home to your wife. And that's, that's, that's what, it's death for you, bud. I said, Dr. Law, I've never met a doctor so obstinate. I mean, you, you just, you think you know it all, don't you? Well, he said, that's my diagnosis. You asked me to find out what's wrong with you. You've got to die. Well, I said, I want you to get this. There are other doctors in this town besides you. Mm-hmm. Dr. Law said, all right, you can go see them. And so I beat it down the, down the street. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, why, listen, that guy's not going to tell me what he told me. All he had to talk about was my heart. Nothing wrong with my heart. So I go down to see Dr. Religion. I'm telling you. Oh, he's a scout. He's a regular feller. Oh, he said, come on in here, Lester Olaf. <laughs> well, I'm glad to see you. I said, yeah, I, I, I'm glad to see you. I said, I've been up to see that one of these doctors. Said, oh, Dr. Law, you... Oh, I said, listen, that guy's nutty. <laughs> Man, he hadn't had any training. He didn't know beans about uh, the later uh, modes of medicine. Why, he's, he's antiquated. That, that's, they all call him Dr. Antique. I said, boy, that sounds good to me. I didn't like him myself. <laughs> I, I, really, I really didn't. And I, I, I said, Dr. Religion, uh, would you just kind of uh, run over me? Oh, he said, sure. said, hey, lay down over here, boy. And he runs over me. Little. He said, nothing serious. <laughs> he said, uh, uh, I recommend that uh, you join the church and get baptized. I think that'll straighten you out. Why, well, I said, I'll do it. I'll do it. And so I, I beat it down to the church, and home. I shake the preacher's hand and never did turn loose of the devils. <laughs> and he said, uh, he said, what is your desire? I said, I, I, I won't join the church. I feel every man ought to be religious. I haven't been feeling too well about the way I've been living. He said, why, we can take care of that. I said, when's the next baptizing? He said, tonight. The fact is, we'll baptize you right now if you want to. You may not come back. <laughs> <laughs> Amen? <Yeah. laughs> we got the, you know, our report goes in next week, so we better baptize you now. <laughs> well, good. All right. And so the... I go in the baptistry, and I went home, and 
Sure enough, boy, I'm telling you, after I got my dry clothes, I felt a little better. I really did. I went home and my wife, you know, she said, Honey, I've always wanted you to join the church. I said, Well, I don't join. <laughs> I said, I, I, It really makes you feel better, doesn't it? I just, and boy, I went through the week, and I'm telling you, I felt better all week. Man, I tell you, I was just riding high. I told my neighbors and friends, I said, Well, I joined the church. And my little children came and said, Daddy, I'm so glad you joined. And I, boy, I tell you, that was wonderful. But boy, after a while, I had them same old symptoms. <laughs> I'm not joking with you. I beat it back down to Dr. Religion. I said, now, uh, Dr. Religion, uh, that, that is awful good for a while, but it looks to me like it's about played out. <laughs> I believe I need a little deeper cure. Well, he said, I tell you, no need getting upset about it. I mean, you seem to be a little emotionally upset. I mean, certainly you're not going to want to be worried, you know. God's a merciful God, and He's kind, and, and you know Jesus would never permit you to go to hell. He, you know God never sends anybody to hell. You know that. Don't. Well, I said, I, I hope not. I really do. And he said, now, i tell you what I believe. Maybe you haven't uh, gone to work yet. And so I believe I'd take about uh, a dose at least once a week of... Uh, good hard work in the church. I'd go down there and I'd uh, just get me a job in the church. Well, listen, I tried all of that and I wound up in the same shape. And one day, I just decided I'd go back to that old mean doctor. So I went back up there. I felt a little sheepish about it, but I went in. I said, Dr. Law, I tried them other doctors. Oh, Dr. Do Good and Be Good and Improve a Little and Join the Church and Dr. Religion. And I tell you, it just looks to me like that's a whole bunch of quacks. Now, I've got to have something happen to me, Doc. And I believe what you told me is just about 100% so. And it looks to me like I'm a dead duck unless somebody gets hold of me. And Dr. Law said, now you're talking business. Now you're talking business. I said, Dr. Law... What actually do you recommend? I said, I told you before, you've got to have an operation. You've got to have an operation. Well, I said, uh, if that's the only way I can live, then uh, when do you want to operate? He said, I don't. I said, you mean I've got to have an operation and you're not going to operate? That means then I've got to go ahead and die. Said, no, he just said, I didn't say that. Well, I said, Doc, explain to me. I'm all confused. I know there's something wrong. He said, I told you what was wrong with your heart. But he said, uh, I want you to go across the hall with me here. There's a doctor across here. He and I have worked together for thousands of years. He said, I'd like for you to meet him. I said, all right. So he leads me across and rings the doorbell and great, big, wonderful, handsome doctor comes to the door, meticulously white and clean. And that's the brightest room I've ever seen in all my life. No roaches, no flies, no dirt, no fail. It's clean in there. Dr. Law, says Dr. Grace, I want you to meet Lester Roloff. He's in a bad shape. I think he finally realizes it. Dr. Grace looked at Dr. Law and said, Has he already tried all the other doctors? He said, Yes, sir, but to no avail. Did you ask him, Dr. Law, if he'd turn his case completely over to me? He said, Yes, sir. He said, Lester Roloff, come on inside. I held the door open, and I said, Dr. Law, since you know me and know what's wrong, you come on in and be here too. No. He said, I, I never come in Dr. Grace's office. Never. I just take you to his office, and I turn you over to him. He's the surgeon. I've never operated yet. I diagnosed your case, son. Now commit yourself to Dr. Grace. The operation will be successful. I said, Dr. Grace, serious now. Perspiration's already come upon my nose and chin. 
And I said, Dr. Grace, uh, could you call my wife and let her be here since it's going to be such a serious operation? No. He said, nobody will be here but just me and you. I'm a private surgeon. Well, I said, Doc, what about the nurses? He said, I don't have any. I do it all myself. Praise God. I'm looking at a real doctor now. Ah, oh, Dr. Grace. Of course, I was scared. I surely was. I said, Doc, and I was trying to stave it off a little longer. I said, Doc, uh, how much uh, is it going to cost? It's, it's going to be a tremendous operation. How much is it going to cost? And Dr. Grace said, Son, it's already been paid for. Why, I said, paid for? You mean somebody's already paid for my operation before I ever saw you? Hey, he said, yes. He said, I'll introduce you to him after the operation. I want you to know him. Well, I said, I'd be glad to meet him. I surely would. I said, now, Dr. Grace, are you sure that it's going to be a success? He said, yes. So I stretch out on the operating table, and this lovely doctor comes. And I'd say, Doc, one more question. Are you going to give me a good, deep anesthetic that will last until you get through operating? No, he said, Son, I never give anesthetics. You smell no ether in here, do you? I said, You mean I'm going to have to stay awake while you're taking my heart out? He said, yes, I have to do it like that, son, so it'll be real to you. And you can tell others what Dr. Grace did to you. Ah, oh, brother, I was there when it happened. I can tell people that Jesus saved me. He made me new. I said, all right, Doc, I'm in your hands now. Oh, Dr. Religion, he failed me. Doctor, do good and be good. All those old boys fail me. I'm still not in too good a humor with Dr. Law. He's so rough. Dr. Grace said, Son, just as soon as I'm through with the operation, you'll love Dr. Law a lot more than you love him now. Oh, that's sweet and good. That's so. He's a lot better man than you think he is, and he's a wonderful diagnostician. He knows exactly. He's never brought a patient to me and told me wrong about one of them. He knows what's wrong with everyone. So Dr. Grace starts in on the operation. Starts in on the op I said, Doc, just a minute. Uh... I, I just, I'm just a little nervous, and I don't know whether I'm ready for this. I, I may ought to be built up a little bit. No, he said, you're just right for it now. <laughs> I, I said, uh, Doc, uh, could, could you give me a quart of glucose or something? Uh, because I, I feel awful weak now. He said, that's where you're supposed to feel when I operate on you. <laughs> I said, Doc, uh, could you operate tomorrow? Boy, when I said that, Dr. Grace said, I never operate tomorrow. Always operate today. Well, I said, Doc, could you just be reasonable with me? And could you, could you promise me uh, th th that you'd operate tomorrow? And Dr. Grace said, Son, you may not be here tomorrow. That's how serious your case is. Well, I said, Doc, if that's on the way out, just start cutting. So, brother, he started in the heart section. He passed up all my toes, my feet. He didn't even glance at my eyes. Didn't tell me to stick out my tongue. Didn't even look at my fingernails or my hands. Brother, I'll guarantee he headed for the heart. And when he took one slice, he fell open. And when it did, there was an odor that I've never smelt before that came out of that heart section. I said, Doc, what's that? He said, Son, you're awful rotten in your heart. Fact is, it's desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. I said, You mean my heart? <laughs> he said, Wait till I bring it out. I'll show it to you. 
Boy, in a minute, with his tender hands, he reached down in and pulled out that old black heart of mine and held it up. And I said, Doc, if you don't mind, throw that thing away. Oh, my soul. There I was arguing with Dr. Law, and he was right, wasn't he? I said, yes, son, he was right. But I said, Dr. Grace, I can't live without a heart, can I? And I don't want that one back. I'd rather die than have that heart. I never want to see it again. And, Doc, if that's the best, I don't want you to just patch it up or overhaul it. Kid, do you have any? He said, son, I've got a brand new loving heart to drop down inside. Ah, listen. I see him as he goes to the sea of God's forgetfulness and throws my old black heart in heaven's garbage can. And away she goes and comes back with a brand new heart. Ah, listen. He puts that heart inside, gently closes up the incision. And I said, Doc, I wonder if it's time for me to look. He said, in just a minute. I said, I'm not going to be ashamed of the scar if I get well. And he said, son, take a look. And I said, Doc, they're not any scar, is they? Oh, perfect operation. And my heart's been different ever since. Oh, listen. I said, Doctor, I want to ask you something. You reckon I'll ever have to have another operation like this? He said, no, sir, this is permanent. I've never had a patient come back on me yet. This heart will never fail you, son. It's brand new. I'm giving you an eternal and everlasting operation. Well, I said, Dr. Grace, do you recommend that I come back for some other treatments? And would you like to check up on me every 30 days? He said, no, sir. The cure is permanent. You're well. Case dismissed. Ah, oh, brother Dr. Grace, I want you to know him. I want you to know him. Well, I said, Dr. Grace, Surely, you've got some advice for me. I need some, I need some good suggestions about how to take care of this new heart. And he said to me, yes, son, I want you to take plenty of good, strong Bible food, and that'll keep her strong. And she'll pump that new blood out through your body. And then he said, there's one other suggestion I want you to get a lot of good exercise. I said, what kind would you suggest? And he said, I'd like for you to kneel a good deal. He said, that'll do you good. Just get down and get up. He said, every once in a while by yourself, fall down on your face and start praying. Don't ever forget what I've done for you, son. I said, Dr. Grace, I'll do it now. Do you have any suggestion about my tongue? You know, I've always had trouble with it. He said, just go tell what Dr. Grace did for you. And tell it everywhere. He said, don't just tell it in Sunday school, son. Tell it on the street. Tell it in the jail. Tell it everywhere. Let that old tongue tell now what's happened to the heart. I said, but Doc, I'm a little worried about my feet. He said, don't worry about your feet because your heart's going to tell your feet what to do from now on. That new heart's going to operate everything about you. Oh, brother, I met the greatest doctor I've ever met in my life. I started out the door. I said to Dr. Grace, he said, I thought you'd want to come back. They always do. I said, I want to meet the friend that paid my bill. He said, I want you to meet him. And he walked into the office and there stood the sweetest friend I've ever had. He raised his hands and I said, Dr. Grace, somebody's operated on him, haven't they? But his scar didn't heal like mine. He said, son, that's Jesus. He paid your bill on Calvary. 
And I said, Dr. Grace, if you don't mind, I'm going to start my exercises. And down on my face. And Jesus said, Son, get up now. It's all right. I'm glad you came to Dr. Grace. I died for you, but I rose again. Your hospital bill, your operation, your examinations all paid in full. Go, son, and sin no more. And when you get home, tell your wife and your children about Dr. Grace and that he's waiting for them if they've got heart trouble. Folks, sinners, how could you turn the Savior down? Oh, I found myself singing this afternoon. When sin-stricken burden and weary from bondage I long to be free, there came to my heart the sweet message His grace is sufficient for thee. His grace is sufficient for thee. His grace is sufficient for thee. In shady green pastures are on the rough sea. His grace is sufficient for thee. When life here on earth is all over, when Jesus my Savior, I see my heart will repeat this sweet message. His grace was sufficient for me. Oh, His grace was sufficient for me. Well, His grace was sufficient for me. In the shady green pastures are on the old rough sea. His grace was sufficient for me. And lost friend, there's only one hope. There's only one hope. And that's to go to Dr. Grace. But before you get to him, you've got to go see Dr. Law. I can hardly wait. I bid Jesus so long. He said, no, so long, I'm going home with you. Amen? Amen. And so I said, you mean you're going to go? He said, I'm going to live with you from now on. I've got to help you. I'm going to see to it that there will be no recurrence of this old trouble again. Fact is, he said, I'm going to live in that new heart of yours. And I said, well, amen. I started down the road and I said, I've got to go tell Miss Roloff because she'll be glad I know. And she'll have a brand new husband. And... Uh, Jesus said to me, and sure enough, he was in my heart. He said, did you forget anything? Well, I said, I, I, oh, yes. I believe, I believe I'll run back. And so I knocked on the door. And the little secretary said, yes. I said, is Dr. Law still in? Oh, yes. Said, I said, I've got to see him. And you know, Dr. Law stepped to the door, and he wasn't mad at me anymore. He had the nicest smile I've ever seen on his face. I said, Dr. Law, I just want to shake hands with you and say thank you for what you've done for me. And, sinner friend, when you get saved, you're going to thank God for his word that convicted you of your sin and sent you with a rotten heart to see Dr. Grace that he might operate on you and save you from your sin. Oh, I recommend these two great doctors every sinner. Lost friend, come to Jesus tonight. Trust him as your personal Savior. Will you bow your heads while we pray? Our Father, we thank thee for this sweet hour of preaching time. Dear Lord, we pray that thou shalt speak now and grant that not one soul will go away without a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Father, bless the one that's closest to the hot doors of damnation tonight and snatch them in love and pity and mercy. And Lord, we pray that you'll put them in Dr. Law's office if they've not already been. And dear Lord, if they've been sitting in Dr. Law's office during this hour, I pray that they might step inside Dr. Grace now 
and let grace step inside them. Dear Lord, save the lost that are here and bless all those who've heard the message. We pray in Jesus' name.